This is Rosa Shaw, and I'm here to guide you to the daily activities, events, and the ins and outs of what occurs on the street. So sit back, relax, enjoy your cup of coffee, purchase one with some popcorn bucks, and enjoy a word from the metaverse. This is Rosa Shaw here, speaking to you from a cafe adjacent to the Black Sun Bar, giving you a latest on what is happening on the street and what is affecting our world here in the metaverse. So on this episode, we are going to discuss Anonymous, the hacktivist, uh, kitchen soup catch-all uh, movement of the uh, mid uh, aughts. Always, it's still in existence all the way up to now, but we're going to primarily focus on its early existence and some of the things it is known to have done, and the different other hack, uh, hacktivists or hacker groups that have uh, participated or. Uh, part of Anonymous. And the reason why we're talking about Anonymous is because we're going to discuss um, certain uh, influential groups that are leading up to stopping net neutrality. Um, Most importantly, the uh, blackout date that's supposed to occur July 12th for a number of very prominent internet companies. One of the biggest get, I guess you can say, is Amazon. Uh, They're going to blackout or shut down or slow down or demonstrate, you know, in some kind of fashion why it's so important to have a free and open internet and not these various different uh, payment channels. But before we talk about Anonymous um, and its influences on hacktivism, um, political movements within the internet sphere and technology, the news. So Apple's court... Uh, not sorry, Apple, but Appeals Court says filming the police is protected by the First Amendment. Uh, this is by Tech Dirt. Uh, this is, uh, there are certain, um, obvious inalienable rights that are constantly, constantly being either reaffirmed or attacked. I mean, the, the, the Supreme Court, various state courts have all over and over iterated that you have the right to film cops, but of course it just, Keeps popping up through the court system, so here we go. This is written Tim Cushion of Tech Dirt. In the news, there will be no surprise that police officers decide that they must do something about someone filming the police department building from across the street. That's where the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals decision begins, with a completely avoidable and completely unnecessary assertion of government power. Philip Turner was filming the police department. He was costed by two officers of Grindels and Diaz. Both demand he provide them with identification. He refused to do so. The officers arrested him for failure to identify, took his camera, and tossed him in the back of a squad car. Given the circumstances of the initial interaction, it's a surprise the words that the contempt of cop weren't used on the police uh, report. Uh, from the opinion, uh, Grindles asked Turner, How's it going, man? Got your ID with you. Turner continued videotaping and couldn't repeat the ask Turner if he had any vacation. Turner asked the officers whether he was being detained and couldn't respond that Turner was being detained for investigation. The officers were concerned about who was walking around with the video corner. camera. Turner asked for which crime he was being detained and Grinnell replied, I didn't say you committed a crime. Grinnell's elaborate, we have the right and authority to know who's walking around our facility. Grinnell again asked for Turner's identification. Grinnell asked, Turner asked Grinnell, what happened if I don't have ID myself? Grinnell asked, well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Grinnell's continued request to Turner's identification, which Turner refused to provide. Grinnell's and Dias then suddenly and without warning handcuffed Turner and took his video camera from him. And Grinnell says, this is what happens when you don't ID yourself. Turner asked whether to speak to the supervisors, given that this happened right across the street from the department. Didn't have to wait very long. A supervisor arrived and came to at least one correct conclusion, that Lieutenant Diver identified himself as a commander. Diver asked Turner what he was doing, and Turner explained that he was taking pictures from the sidewalk across the street. Driver asked Turner for his ID, and Turner told the lieutenant that he did not have to identify himself because he had not been lawfully arrested, and that he chose not to provide his out of medication. Uh, driver replied, you're right. Texas police officers love to mistreat the state's failure to identify statute. It doesn't say what they think it does or what they want it to believe it does. A former cop turned law student has a full explanation here. Besides to say, cops cannot arrest someone for refusing to identify themselves, at least not in Texas. Uh, the charge can be added after an arrest if they refuse to go to his, but it can't be the emphasis for an arrest. After some discussion between the officers, Turner was released and his camera was given back. Turner filed a civil rights lawsuit. The lower court granted immunity to the officers on the allegation that the, the Fifth Circuit, however, refused to go as far. 
and in doing so, actually takes it upon itself to address an issue it easily could have avoided, whether the First Amendment covers the filming of public service, specifically law enforcement officers. First, the court asked whether the right to film police was clearly established at the time the incident took place. It can't find anything that says it is. Um, at the time it's happening, neither the Supreme Court nor, is, nor the court had determined whether First Amendment protection extends to the recording of filming police. Although Turner says that some district courts in the circuit have concluded that the First Amendment protection extends to video recording of police activity in light of general First Amendment principles, the Supreme Court has repeatedly instructed courts not to define clearly established law at a high level of generality. The general position, for example, that an unreasonable search or seizure violates the Fourth Amendment is a little help to determine whether the violate the violated nature of particular conduct is clearly established. Thus, Turner's reliance on decision what clarified that the First Amendment protections extend to gathering information does not demonstrate whether the Pacific Act is issued here. Video according to the police or police station were clearly established. The court doesn't have they will leave it there, although it could have. The court notes that there is a circuit split on the issue, but just because the issue is far from decided doesn't mean courts have not recognized the right exists. It points to the conclusion reached by the first and the last circuit appeals courts as evidence that the right to film police has been acknowledged, and even so, there's not enough clarity on the issue to remove the officer's immunity. Um, and it goes on with the opinion. Um, okay, so this is where the opinion gets interesting. While many judges will leave a trickier, somewhat tangible issue open and unanswered, the fifth court circuit appeals court decides it's time for it to set some precedent. We conclude that the First Amendment principles control authority and pervasive precedent demonstrates that the First Amendment right to record the police does exist, subject only to reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. To be sure, speech is an essential mechanism of democracy, for that it means to hold officials accountable to the people. The right of the citizens is required to hear, to speak, and to use information to reach consensus is a precondition to enlighten self-government and necessary means to protect it. Filming the police contributes to the public's ability to hold the police accountable. Ensuring that the police officers are not abusing the power and make informed decisions about police policy. Filming police also frequently help officers, for example, a citizen recording might corroborate a probable cause finding or might even exonerate an officer charged with wrongdoing. So there you have it. This is something that's going to be constantly attacked, uh, I believe, in North Carolina. They have made it to where uh, the body cameras and the video footage that uh, law enforcement have is not public communication. I know that is being challenged. There's other restrictions that... Um, Law enforcement has done even so far as charging exorbitant fees to obtain police footage, um, delaying the release of these documentations and things of that nature. So this is going to be a consistent and ongoing battle, and it's it's just ridiculous. I think there are going to be some very decisive legislative and uh, court cases coming down the line when it comes to uh, law enforcement, and it might necessarily be in the best interest of the people when it comes to that. Apple, How Apple sidesteps Billy's attack. This is from the New York Times by Charles Bilhung and David uh, Kowinski. Uh, Reno, Nevada. Uh, Apple, the world's most profitable technology company, doesn't design iPhones here. It doesn't turn Apple Care customer service from the city, and it doesn't manufacture MacBooks or iPads anywhere nearby. Yet, with a handful of employees in a small office here in Reno, Apple has done something central to its corporate strategy. It has avoided millions of dollars in taxes in the California and 20 other states. Apple's headquarters are in Capante, California. By putting an office in Reno just 200 miles away to collect and invest the company's profits, Apple sidesteps state income taxes on some of the gains. Uh, California's corporate tax rate is 8.84%. Nevada's zero. Setting up an office in Reno just one of many... Uh, legal methods Apple has used to reduce its worldwide tax bill by billions of dollars each year. As it has in Nevada, Apple has created subsidiaries in low-tax places like Ireland, the Netherlands, uh, Luxembourg, and the British Virgin Islands, some little more than a letterbox or an anonymous office that help get, cut the taxes it pays around the world. Almost every major corporation tries to minimize its taxes, of course. For Apple, the savings are especially alluring because the company's profits are so high. Wall Street analysis predict that Apple can earn up to... $4.6 billion in the current fiscal year, which would be a record for any American business. Apple serves as a window on how technology giants have taken advantage of tax codes written for an industrial age and ill-suited for today's digital economy. Some profits that companies like Apple, Google, Amazon, uh, Hewitt Packard, and Microsoft derive not from physical goods, but from royalties on intellectual property, like the patents on software that make devices work. Other times, the products themselves are digital, like download songs. It's much easier for a business with royalties and digital uh, products to move profits to low tax countries than it is for grocery stores or automa uh, automakers. A download application on like a car can be sold from anywhere. Uh, the growing digital economy presents a conundrum for lawmakers overseeing corporate taxation. 
Although technology is now one of the nation's largest, most valued in industries, many tech companies are among the least taxed according to the government and corporate data. Over the last two years, 71 technology companies in the Standard Poor's 500 Stock Index include Apple, Google, Yahoo, and Dell reported paying worldwide cash tax at a rate that on average was a third less than other SP companies. Cash tax may include payments for multiple years. Even among tech companies, Apple's rates are low, and while the company has uh, remade uh, industries and added economic growth and delighted customers, it also devised corporate strategies to take advantage of gaps in the tax code, according to the former executive who helped create those strategies. And Apple, for instance, was among the first tech companies to designate overseas salespeople in high-tax countries in a manner that allowed them to sell on behalf of the low tax subsidies in, on other continents, sidestepping income tax, according to former executives. Apple was a pioneer of the accounting techno- technique known as the Double Irish with a Dutch Sandwich, which reduced taxes by routing profits through Irish subsidies in, in the Netherlands and then to the Caribbean. Uh, today, the tactic is used by hundreds of, of other corporations, some of which directly in- emanate um, Apple's methods as accountants at those companies. Without such tactics, Apple's federal tax bill in the United States most likely would have been would have been 2.4 billion higher last year, according to a recent study by former Treasury Department Ec- Economics. Martin A. Sullivan. As it stands, the companies paid cash tax of $3.3 billion around the world on a reported profits of $34.2 billion last year, a tax rate of 9.8%. Apple does not disclose what portions of those payments were was in the United States or which portions is assigned to previous or future years. By comparison, Walmart last year paid worldwide cash tax of $5.9 billion on its book profit of $24.4 billion, a tax rate of 24%, which is about average for non-tech companies. So, this is a thing, and given that Google has just been hit with a um, $2 billion uh, fine, um, Apple is also hit with a fine, I think you're going to see uh, some movement when it comes to the corporate tax code. I don't know how much of a movement is going to be, what percentages or loopholes are going to, going to uh, change. People are basically shaking the tree, if you will, to try to get uh, various governments are trying to get um, as much uh, taxes as they can. Um, the collection of taxes is already been very co- problematic and complex, and the spending by all these governments and their obligations have exceeded what they've been um, bringing in. So we'll see what happens here. Um, if any of all these loopholes are going to close up, I know Ireland has changed some of its policies. Um, We'll see, um, because as disruptive as technology is and as the benefits it has done, um, it's been such a disruption to where, you know, the robots are coming, automation is coming, you know, what are people going to do to to earn or make a living and how many of, you know, of the population is going to be capable of making a living, that their jobs have value, if you will, and then what? So there's a, so these are pieces of a very long and complicated problem that has been building up for centuries, really. A uh, federal bill introduced that to add a warrant requirement to Stingray deployment. Again, this is from Tech Dirt, uh, again by uh, Tim Kirshen. Uh The House Oversight Committee Chairman, uh, Jason Charles, uh, Chaffetz, who's no longer uh, in Congress, along with Senator counterpart uh, Ron Wynn, it's talking about something he promised to act on after he finished exhorting the leaky Office of Personal Management for ruining the lives of millions of Americans, Stingray devices. And there was an expert here, so we're just going to stick with the article. Uh, what the bill would do is codify the GO, DOG Stingray Best Practices poly, Policy, which implemented a warrant requirement for cell site simulator deployment. A bit one that wasn't really a requirement because it wasn't a statutory required. This would be a statutory requirement that DOG uh, better late than never approach to constitutionality was missing. But the bill doesn't limit itself to sell, cell tower spoofers. It also would add a layer of protection to data the DOG has long argued isn't covered by the Fourth Amendment. The legislature is sort of a thing the courts are apparently looking for when they kick, uh, kick crucial issues down the road. When outdated statutes present opportunities to refine the Fourth Amendment confines, judges are frequently willing to tell plaintiffs and defendants to take it up with Congress if they don't like the answer or non-answer they presented. Uh, the Supreme Court is no exception when it sort of found warrants might be a good idea when deploying GPS devices for long-term tracking. And everyone could so far as to say a warrant should be required in all cases. It seemed concerned about the length of the tracking, but it let, at, let it probably when all was said and done. The DOG has been, ar- been has, uh, often argued that several outdated statutes 
should be updated to reflect the changing contours of today's connected, always on online world. But this is not the sort of thing that is ever argued for. It would much prefer to see its power reach expand the, at the expense of the Americans' privacy. The bill of pass would nece- not wouldn't necessarily fix what's wrong with the past legislation and jurisprudence, but it would at least prevent multiple law enforcement agencies from deploying these invasive devices on a whim or using them to engage in mass surveillance just because they can. The Digital Economy Act and Lido Cody streams could now land users in prison for ten years. This is from the Independent. Uh, if you don't know what a Cody is, a Cody is a basically like a fire stick or a Raspberry Pi. Um, it's these um, little add-on devices you plug into either your television or um, your computer, laptop, something of that nature that allows you to have access to uh, either cable or uh, television or movies or uh, music. Uh, basically, BitTorrent um, on steroids, really. Um, it's very easy to use. It get grant, grant, grants you access to a wide breadth, uh, breadth of various television programs. Um, some lawfully attain, majority of them not. But uh, these devices have become very popular in the last five years. And the MPAA and other um, industry, um, media industries have been um, going after Cody and going after these devices and going after these people very uh, aggressively to either make or distribute or uh, come up with the software to uh, allow for the distribution of digital content, if you will. Authorities are becoming increasingly concerned about the media players loaded with open source software and a variety of third party add ons. The Digital Economy Act was passed into law, meaning people could now face 10 year prison sentences for illegally streaming copyrighted content. Uh, this is from the in- Independent in the UK, and it was written by Atoff uh, Sullivan. It covers a wide number of areas, including broadband speeds, access to online pornography, and government data sharing. However, amid the rising popularity of Cody, an increase to the maximum prison term from two years to ten for people guilty of copyright infringement is particularly interesting. Anyone caught streaming TV shows, films, and sports events illegally using websites, torrent, and Cody add-ons could technically face a decade behind bars. However, the new law will most likely target individuals and groups making a business out of selling illegal content. Uh, Fact CEO Karen Sharp told the Mirror, "On the right of the Digital Economy Act has become law," said Matt Hancock, the Minister of State and Digital Culture. The legislation will help build a more connected and strong economy. The act will enable major improvements in broadband rollout, better support for consumers, better protection for children on the internet, and further transformation of government services. Authorities and broadcasters have been increasingly concerned about media players loaded with Cody and a variety of third-party add-ons that provide free access to copyrighted content. Uh, Police Scotland recently claimed that criminal gangs, uh, this is in quotes, have started selling media players preloaded with Cody and a variety of third-party add-ons because they see it as a less risky area of crime. This is not seen as being uh, normalized, says Chief uh, Inspector Mark Leonard, uh, Police Scotland's lead on counterfeiting. A family will sit and watch one of these IPTV devices. Amazon and the Premier League are also cracking down on legal streams fed to media players run by Cody. So 10 years for, for a movie. Murderers and rapists don't even get that. The guy who saved your iPhone from hackers is stuck in a UAD jail. Uh, this is from Motherboard by Tanya, uh, Tanya O'Carroll. Uh, million dollar descendant Ahmad Masar actions protected millions of iPhone users from sophisticated spyware. If you care about your privacy and security, you should be fighting for his release. Uh, this article was authored by Amnesty International and published on Motherboard with permission. When most of the tech world first heard the name activist Ahmed Masur had already spent more than a decade fighting against human rights abuses in his native United Arabs. But it was a series of suspicious text messages he received last year that briefly shone and turned the tech world's attention to Mansour, a poet and blogger who campaigns for freedom of expression and civil and political rights. The message delivered to his iPhone 6 and on 10, on the 10th and 11th of August promised to reveal new secrets about taini- detainees tortured in the UA prison and contained a hyperlink to an unfamiliar website. It would have been easy to click, but Masur was hyper vigilant. He had to be. He had already been hacked twice by the Emirate authorities, and the suffocated surveillance he knew he was under had in the past led to a beating, a spell in prison, and the imposition of a travel ban. Seeing something was right, he passed the message on to a security researcher who alerted Apple to a series of support software flaws on the iPhone, which made users vulnerable to hacking. Apple corrected the problem quickly, and Ahmed was credited for discovery, which had helped improve security for millions of iPhone users worldwide. While updating your software, you should pause for a moment to thank the human rights activist Ahmed Mansour, said Robert Ronald Dilbert, the director of Citizen Lab. The spyware which Mansour 
had been targeted was so sophisticated and expensive that Citizen Labs researchers dubbed him the Million Dollar Descendant. The life of the Descendant in the U.S. UE is bleak. Fast forward to 2017, Ahmed Masur is in solitary confinement in a UE jail. In the six weeks since he was seized in the middle of the night from his apartment, he was effectively been denied access to a lawyer. To make matters worse, he's been allowed just one face-to-face -face visit with his wife and has not seen his children since his arrest. Meanwhile, the UE continues to, ex to ascend as a bright new star in the tech world, the destination of choice for startups seeking access to emerging markets across the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. The same authorities who have been harassed in pursuing Ahmed Masur for his peaceful activism are increasingly successful in the efforts to revamp the country's to Silicon Oasis. Twitter, Facebook, and even Apple have headquarters there. Middle East operation in Dubai's impressive high rises. And Emirate ruler Mohammed bin Rashid al Maktoum has called the EE an incubator of innovation and future technology. But million dollar descendant gets no part in the dreams of the future, and the tech community has moved on while he languishes in jail. The charges against Monsieur are su superior. He's accused of using social media websites to publish false information and rumors, promoting the sectarian and hate inside his agenda, and publish false and misleading information that harms national unity and damages the country's reputation. It's deeply ironic the UAE established claims to be so excited about the opportunities of technology brings his intent of allowing freedom of expression online. And we must not be fooled by the glittering facade of Silicon and Oasis. Behind it is a tightening use of repression and fear, and while the lights may be on, voices of dissent have been switched off one by one. And the, the article goes on critiquing, you know, this facade. But... I bring this up because there's been a series of similar activists that have been arrested. Some of them have been subject to spyware, where they either identified it or um, because of the spyware they were scooped up. Uh, this has happened in Mexico with journalists. Um, it's, it's happening pre pretty much all over the world, and we'll talk about it. And a lot of it, it has to do the reason why we have an understanding or knowing about these. Um, Spyware and security exploits is because of things like WikiLeaks and Bolt, uh, their Bolt 7, but also the shadow brokers where a lot of these bugs and zero days and exploits and problems with various operate, um, OS's, you know, Mac, a Windows, Linux, uh, and various phone devices were aware of all the different, um, the attack vectors and attack sets. Primarily the U.S., but because they um, give these exploits to other countries, are utilizing. And so, because of this awareness, there's patches being made. People are going so deep into various hardware devices, um, software devices, to figure out and find out where other exploits and vulnerabilities are. Making patches, and then there's a you know both criminal and other government agencies that may not had necessarily had the access or understanding of these exploits beforehand now do are creating various um, attacks and malwares and releasing them online. Um, that's why the series of various DO, uh, DOD, um, you know, the DOS attacks, as well as the uh, different iterations of ransom, ransomware that's been happening, especially it was happening in Ukraine, are a result of these leaks. And fundamentally what's going to have to come down to is there may have to be a literally a very basic top, you know, bottom from top, breakdown of every single component that exists out there in the internet and basically redesign it with the concept of privacy in mind. Now mind you this is being designed by humans and you're not going to get every little deep, every little thing but I think there's going to be a push for more open and awareness and more targeting of um, devices before being released to find these exploits so they can be patched and so that they're not um, you're not necessarily walking around with a, a major, you know, spyware device. But given that the government has, you know, particularly the United States, has been doing this for decades, they are decades ahead with a lot of these different exploits. Um, I'm not sure, uh, even if these discussions that are happening on message boards, if this is going to be a very viable solution. But it's nonetheless one of sol those solutions. And here we have is a, a gentleman in the UAE that has um, prevented other people from being exploited um, around the world and thanks to him that that's not going to happen but he is currently being detained and then you also have this very weirdness and eventually we're going to talk about this I want to say weirdness but this very callousness within the Silicon Valley where they overlook a lot of well it's not just them but you're overlooking uh, by corporations of all these different um, human rights issues and exploitative of people 
for the purpose of gains. And I guess it fundamentally it has to come down to capitalism, but it's not necessarily just capitalism. It just has to do with human nature and needs and wants and things of that nature and a lack of empathy, if you will. But that's it for the news. A bit of a downer, but... Um, so we're going to go on and just start discussing um, Anonymous. So Anonymous. Anonymous came in upon us in the early aughts, still around, um, but his heyday, or I'd say his strength, is probably between the years of 2008 and 2012, uh, during the um, first Obama administration, uh, during the global collapse. Um, a lot of what fueled the activities in Anonymous had to do with the economy crashing, the housing market, the job market, just everything crashing, as well as revelations um, beginning with WikiLeaks um, about, you know, the surveillance of private citizens and then eventually leading up to Edward Snowden and then further uh, disclosures from WikiLeaks and other news organizations. But before we kind of get into everything Anonymous has done. What is it? So the Anonymous group, what is it and how big is it? This is by Ali Raza by Hackery. Our research provided that Anonymous hacktivist group is relatively much bigger than you anticipate and become become quite popular among people all over the world. But how did it start? Uh, The Anonymous group has been gaining a lot of attention in the past few years. This is mainly due to the way they act and the way they portray themselves. People donning Guy Fox masks and taking down the government and non-government uh, agencies are sure to attract some attention. And because the activities are anonymous is not restricted to a single country, they have gained global attention. When people talk about hacktivist groups, people have often wondered just how big the group is, uh, given their widespread activities. However, the question is not easy to give a definitive answer to. As to what the group is, we take a look at, it, at that here. Beginning. Anonymous first came to existence in 2003 when an unknown user who was tagged as Anonymous posted images on 4chan slash B uh, board. The images were about random things, but the Anonymous tag soon gained popularity on the website. The group then escalated their activities to internet pranks, troll events, and raiding websites like that of Hubu Hotel in Finland. Um, so if you don't know what Hubu Hotel is a, a social uh, networking service, an online community aimed at teenagers. The website is owned and operated by Suki, a Finnish corporation. The service began in 2000 and expanded to nine online communities or hotels where users in over 150 countries. As of August 2012, over 273 avatars have been registered uh, with an average of 5 million unique visitors. 90% of Hubu's users are between the ages of 13 and 18. Uh, the service allows users to generate their own Hubu character and design hotel rooms, meet new friends, chat with other people, organize parties, look out for virtual pets, create and play games, and complete quests. Uh, Hubu stemmed in the 1990 hobby project by creator, designer, Subhook Kajin, and technologist Ebiku. So it was a, basically a game and social media network uh, that a lot of kids played with. And given the wide breadth of age that a number of anonymous people are part of, it's not a surprise that Hubu uh, was eventually a target, because a lot of anonymous actors are, in fact, teenagers who are of this age range. So it was a game, and... The, We'll get into the, the different uh, particular acts that Hubu has, uh, acts like Hubu and other uh, activities that uh, Anonymous has done. We're just, we're just trying to give a thumbnail sh- sketch of what this organization, or not even an organization, but what this, it's not even a movement, what, what, it, what Anonymous is. So 2004, they started using a website, Encyclopedia Dramatica, as a platform for their activities. For some years, they did little more than mass pranks and take action against communities to support anti-piracy uh, acts. Uh, change of stance. In 2008, Anonymous started Project Changeology, a direct campaign against the Church of Scientology. The campaign included repeated carrying out DOS attacks on the Church websites. Uh, the Anonymous members, or Anons as they called, used to make prank calls to the Church hotline and send blank faxes to them, wasting their ink cartridges. Uh, the project resulted in the group gaining global criticism from the media and authorities and global appreciation from casual internet users. In 2010, Anonymous took their next big step, taking down the website of um, Alpix Software using a, a, a DOS attack. Uh, Apex was a company based in India which partnered with direct film studios to launch DOS attacks against uh, peer-to-peer sharing platforms and websites like Private Pay. The group next took down the website of Recorded Industry Associations of America and Motion Picture Associations of America. Uh, these are the industry trade groups that protect um, the copyrights of 
the music industry and the mo and movies and films and television. I know the project Payback is a bitch. They hacked the website of Copyright Alliance, giving the reason an act against all those who want to silence people's rights to spread information, and this attack website of companies like Amazon, PayPal, Visa, and MasterCard. The attack named Operation Avenge Assan was carried out because they are the are far and companies boycotted WikiLeaks. Other groups and agendas of anonymous. Anonymous and hacked groups that have grown enormously since it first came into existence. The number of groups that are associated with anonymous with uh, WellSec and Operation Anti-Sec. These groups have also targeted government agencies, video games, media groups, etc. Uh, WellSec was formed after anonymous attack at HB Gray. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but we're just going to keep on going on. Uh, speaking about philosophies behind anonymous, there's no particular set of guidelines that the, that the group follows. It's merely a vast and intricate net of, uh, network of like-minded hackers who work with common ideas and goals. Recently, they've been involved in taking down the Donald Trump's Trump Towers website following the presidential candidate's remarks on Muslim immigrants in the U.S. However, the most notable anonymous projects which have gained them the most admirers are their campaign against ISIS. The group are quite active in taking down any website that copies or spreads the propaganda of terrorist outfit. They have had moved to the dark net, posted a message next to an uh, advert for a pharmaceutical company that so sold Prozac and Viagra. The group is also active against a uh, pedophile website, saying they are against the injustice of any kind. And I will have a link in the show notes to um, different documentaries that kind of go through the various um, phases and groups that are part of Anonymous. So you have that news article, and it kind of, again, is a very thumbnail sketch. Uh, I'm going to go here from the Wicca and just kind of piece out some of the some of what's going on here. So Anonymous is a loosely associated, associated international network of activists and hacktivist entities. A website nominally associated with the group describes it as an internet gathering with a very loose and decentralized command structure that operates on ideas rather than directives. The group has been known for a series of well-publicized publicity stunts and distributed denial of service attacks, or DOS. DDoS, uh, attacks on government, uh, religious, and corporate websites. Um, anonymous originated in 2003 on an image, of, image board of 4chan, so we kind of covered all that. So let's get into the philosophy. Anonymous has no strictly defined philosophy, and eternal descent is a regular feature of the group. Um, a website associated with the group describes it as an internet gathering with a very loose decentralized command structure that operates on ideas rather than directives. Uh, Gabriel Coleman writes of the group, In some ways, it may be impossible to gauge the intent and motives of thousands of participants, many of them who don't even bother to leave a trace of their thoughts, motivations, or reactions. Among those that do, opinions vary uh, considerably. Broadly speaking, um, Anon suppose internet censorship and control, and the majority of their actions target governments, organizations, or corporations that they accuse of censorship. Anons were early supporters of the global um, occupied movement and the Arab Spring. Uh, since 2008, a frequent subject of disagreement with Anon Anonymous is whether members should focus on pranking, entertainment, or more serious, in some case, political activism. Anonymous just happen to be a group of people on the internet who need just kind of an ally to do as we wish, that we may be able to do in the regular society. There's more or less that point of it, and do as you wish. That's the common phrase. We are doing it for the lulls. Uh, Trent Peacock searching in the face of Anonymous. Uh, it's a quote from February 7th, 2008. Because Anonymous has no leadership, no action can be attributed to the membership as a whole. Um, Parme, Olson, and others have criticized media coverage that presents the group as a well-organized uh, homogenous. And Olson writes that there was no single leader pulling the levers, but a few organizational minds that sometimes pulled together to start planning a stunt. Some members protest using legal means, while others employ illegal measures such as uh, DDoS attacks and hacking. Membership is open to anyone who wishes to state that they are a member of the collective. Uh, British journalist Carol uh, Catwaller of the Observer compared the group to a decentralized structure, that of a a group anyone can be part of is a, in it is a crowd of people, a nebulous crowd of people, working together and doing things together for various purposes. The group's few rules include not disclosing one's identity, not talking about the group, and not attacking media. Members commonly use the tagline, we are anonymous, we are legion, we do not forgive, we do not forget, accept us, expect us. Uh, Brian Kelly writes that the three of the group's key characteristics are one, unrelenting moral stance on issues and rights regardless of direct provocation, two, a physical presence that uh, accompanies online hacking activity, and three, a distinctive brand. Journalists have commented that anonymous secret fabrications and media awareness poses an unusual challenge for reporting on the group's actions and motivations. Uh, Quinn Norton of Wired writes that anonymous, anonymous lie when they have a re no reason to lie. They weave vast fabrications of form and performance. And then they tell the truth in unexpected and unfortunate times, sometimes destroying themselves in the process. They are unpredictable. 
Norton states it is difficult in reporting on the group because most writers, including himself, uh, including herself, to focus on the small groups of hackers who stole the limelight from a legion, uh, defy their values and crash violating the law, rather than anonymous sea of voices all experimenting with new ways of being in the So yeah, so this right here kind of really sums up what Anonymous is. And the reason why I'm kind of covering and talking about him is because they have significantly influenced the, the concept of hacktivism, uh, which we'll here define. Uh, their, the various groups that are associated, particularly laws we would talk about, and the different activities they've done on the internet, has um, influenced not only other movements and groups within this space, from things like, you know, the Arab Spring they supported, Occupy Movement, um, the Umbrella Movement, uh, which is the Hong Kong Movement, uh, the protests that have occurred uh, throughout Europe, even Venezuela, the various ways that different groups, you know, try to protect their identity, try to protect themselves, try to engage, uh, raise funds, uh, speak to the media, not speak to the media, how they uh, self-publish, how they interact and engage, is very much influenced by some of the activities that they did during this very heightened period between, I would say, um, 2007 all the way to about 20, 2012. And it's because of that, uh, their influences and the different things that they helped support and participated in, in um, really um, focused on the internet as not only as a more than just a new a tool or a, a pastime activity, but uh, harnessing its power to not only do good or even destructive things. Um, some of the things they've done is, you know, pretty destructive, loss of money, loss of income. But how you can affect change um, through the usage of these target attacks, whether it be DOS attacks or uh, hacking into various servers and disclosing information, um, relentless uh attacks through propaganda and media, um, or counter-propaganda, if you will, pro physical protests out in the streets, uh, has significantly influenced the nature and way upon which, from now on, people are going to start conducting themselves when it comes to political activities, when they try to address the regret of their, you know, address their, their governments around the world, really. It's also influenced how companies engage in, and interact in the things that they support. Uh, even if it was, you know, at one point might have been their economic interest to be, you know, a uh, supporter of net neutrality, but because of the nature of the way social media and engagement and the way uh, hacktivism has come to arise, they don't, these companies do not want to see a dip in their profits and the dip of their um, resources simply because uh, they put their foot in their mouth or they're on the wrong side of things. And so you're seeing a more greater awareness of social issues and social consciousness, uh, not only by people, by the, the things and the products that they purchase and buy, which has always been going on, I would say since the 60s, but it's really, I think I would say the millennials have been very consistent in their purchasing and buying power and the things that they do, versus um, even the generation that started it, which was the baby boomers and, you know, the late uh, great generation, uh, the, the youngest members of that generation, um, more so than Xers, if you will. Uh, has influenced the, the corporate nature of companies and they're become more aware of this so that they're not, you know, attack and having their servers go down or having all their secrets spilled out on the streets. Whether or not it actually, this is very surface changes or there's actually, um, actually real things going on is, uh, only time will tell. This is still, you know, even though this movement started in 2003, slash 2004, this is 2017, uh, you're seeing dr some dramatic changes, but I think it's still it's still going to be some time to see whether or not it's beyond just a surface change, but a really fundamental, deep down core to the foundation changes in nature upon how everything is done, really. how um, companies engage and interact on the internet, how hacktivists and governments uh, engage in ha and, and uh, speak with one another, how, which social issues come into prominence how to advocate with uh, your cause, if you will, um, in this very uh, media age, um, social media, internet-driven age. So I'm going to talk about the rise of hacktivism here. Um, this is a pretty good article from the Journal of Georgetown EDU that kind of covers um, hacktivism, if you will. It's by Dorothy Binning, The Rise of Hacktivism. Uh, this came out in 2015, September 2015, so... The rise of the internet and related technologies brought with it new methods and practices in all areas of human activity, including activism. Activism in particular affected in two ways. First, new technologies gave protesters a convenient and powerful means to spread their message and mobilize action globally. 
And second, the topic of this article, Technology and Innovation Gave Processors the Ability to Employ Hacking Tools to Conduct Cyber Operations analog Analogous to Street Protests and Sit-Ins. This blend of hacking with activism known as hacktivism has become increasingly prevalent and is now commonplace. Hacktivism is challenging international affairs not only because it transcends borders, but also because it becomes an instrument of national power. So early history. Um, hacktivism emerged in the late 80s at the time when the hacking for fun and profit was becoming noticeable threats. Uh, initially, it took the form of computer viruses and worms that spread across, spread messages of protest. A good example of early hacktivism is Worm Against Nuclear Killers, or WANK, a computer worm that anti-nuclear activists in Australia unleashed into the network of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, and the U.S. Department of Energy in 1989 to protest the launch of a satellite which carried radioactive plutonium. By the mid-1990s, denial of service, uh, DDoS attacks, have been added to the hacktivist toolbox, which is still pretty much a standard set. So, anonymous. Anonymous came into prominence in the early aughts, still around, um, but its heyday, or I would say its strength, is probably between the years of 2008 and 2012, uh, during the... Um, first Obama administration, uh, during the global collapse. Um, a lot of what fueled the activities in Anonymous had to do with the economy crashing, the housing market, the job market, just everything crashing, as well as revelations um, beginning with WikiLeaks um, about, you know, the surveillance of private citizens and then eventually leading up to Edward Snowden and then further... Uh, disclosures from WikiLeaks and other news organizations. But before we kind of get into everything Anonymous has done, what is it? So the Anonymous group, what is it and how big is it? This is by Ali Raza by Hackery. A research provided that Anonymous hacktivist group is relatively much bigger than you anticipate and become, and become quite popular among people all over the world. But how did it start? Uh, the Anonymous group has been gaining a lot of attention in the past few years. This is mainly due to the way they act and the way they portray themselves. People donning Guy Fox masks and taking down the government and non-government uh, agencies are sure to attract some attention. And because the activities are anonymous is not restricted to a single country, they have gained global attention. When people talk about hacktivist groups, people have often wondered just how big the group is, uh, given their widespread activities. However, the question is not easy to give a definitive answer to. As to what the group is, we take a look at, it, at that here beginning. Anonymous first came to existence in 2003 when an unknown user who was tagged as Anonymous posted images on 4chan slash B uh, board. The images were about random things, but the Anonymous tag soon gained popularity on the website. The group then escalated their activities to internet pranks, troll events, and raiding websites like that of Hubu Hotel in Finland. Um, so if you don't know what Hubu Hotel is a, a social uh, networking service, an online community aimed at teenagers. The website is owned and operated by Suki, a Finnish corporation. The service began in 2000 and expanded to nine online communities or hotels where users in over 150 countries. As of August 2012, or 273 avatars have been registered uh, with an average of 5 million unique visitors. 90% of Hubu's users are between the ages of 13 and 18. Uh, the service allows users to generate their own Hubu character and design hotel rooms, meet new friends, chat with other people, organize parties, look out for virtual pets, create and play games, and complete quests. Uh, Hubu stemmed in the 1990 hobby project by creator, designer, Subha Kajin, and technologies Ebuku. So it was a, basically a game and social media network uh, that a lot of kids played with. And given the wide breadth of age that a number of anonymous people are part of, it's not a surprise that Hubu uh, was eventually a target, because a lot of anonymous actors are, in fact, teenagers who are of this age range. So it was a game, and... The, We'll get into the, the different uh, particular acts that Hubu has, uh, acts like Hubu and other uh, activities that uh, Anonymous has done. We're just, we're just trying to give a thumbnail ske sketch of what this organization, or not even an organization, but what this, it's not even a movement, what, what, it, what Anonymous is. So 2004, they started using a website, Encyclopedia Dramatica, as a platform for their activities. For some years, they did little more than mass pranks and take action against communities that support anti-piracy uh, acts. Uh, change of stance. In 2008, Anonymous started Project Changeology, a direct campaign against the Church of Scientology. The campaign included repeated carrying out DOS attacks on the Church websites. Uh, the Anonymous members, or Anons as they called, used to make prank calls to the Church hotline and send blank faxes to them, wasting their ink cartridges. 
Uh, the project resulted in the group gaining global criticism from the media and authorities and global appreciation from casual internet users. In 2010, Anonymous took their next big step, taking down the website of uh, Alpix software using a, a, a DOS attack. Uh, Apex was a company based in India which partnered with direct film studios to launch DOS attacks against uh, peer-to-peer sharing platforms and websites like Pirate Bay. The group next took down the website of Recorded Industry Associations of America and Motion Picture Associations of America. Uh, these are the industry trade groups that protect um, the copyrights of the music industry and, the mo- and movies and films and television. Under the project Payback is a Bitch, they hacked the website of Copyright Alliance, giving them reason to act against all those who want to silence people's rights to spread information, and this attack website of companies like Amazon, PayPal, Visa, and MasterCard. The attack named Operation Avenge Assange was carried out because they are, they are all fall companies boycotted WikiLeaks. Other groups and agendas of anonymous. Anonymous and hacked with groups that have grown enormously since it first came into existence. The number of groups that are associated with anonymous with uh, WellSec and Operation AntiSec. These groups have also targeted government agencies, video games, media groups, etc. Uh, WellSec was formed after anonymous attack at HB Gray. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but we're just going to keep on going on. Uh, speaking about philosophies behind anonymous, there's no particular set of guidelines in the, that the group follows. It's merely a vast and intricate neck of a network of like-minded hackers who work with common ideas and goals. Recently, they've been involved in taking down the Donald Trump's Trump Towers website following the presidential candidate's remarks on Muslim immigrants in the U.S. However, the most notable anonymous projects which have gained them the most admire is their campaign against ISIS. The group are quite active in taking down any website that copies or spreads the propaganda of terrorist outfit. They have had moved to the dark net, posting a message next to an uh, advert for a pharmaceutical company that sold Prozac and Viagra. The group is also active against a uh, pedophile website, saying they are against the injustice of any kind. And I will have a link in the show notes to um, different documentaries that kind of go through the various um, phases and groups that are part of Anonymous. So you have that news article, and it kind of, again, is a very thumbnail sketch. Uh, I'm going to go here from the Wicca and just kind of piece out some of the some of what's going on here. So Anonymous is a loosely associated, associated international network of activists and hacktivist entities. A website nominally associated with the group describes it as an internet gathering with a very loose and decentralized command structure that operates on ideas rather than directives. The group has been known for a series of well-publicized publicity stunts and distributed denial-of-service attacks, or DOS. DDoS, uh, tax on government, uh, religious, and corporate websites. Um, anonymous originated in 2003 on an image, uh, image board of 4chan, so we kind of covered all that. So let's get into the philosophy. Anonymous has no strictly defined philosophy, and eternal descent is a regular feature of the group. Um, a website associated with the group describes it as an internet gathering with a very loose decentralized command structure that operates on ideas rather than directives. Uh, Gabriel Coleman writes of the group, In some ways, it may be impossible to gauge the intent and motives of thousands of participants, many of them who don't even bother to leave a trace of their thoughts, motivations, or reactions. Among those that do, opinions vary uh, considerably. Broadly speaking, um, Anon oppose internet censorship and control, and the majority of their actions target governments, organizations, and corporations that they accuse of censorship. Anons were early supporters of the global um, occupied movement and the Arab Spring. Uh, since 2008, a frequent subject of disagreement within our notice is whether members should focus on pranking and entertainment or more serious, in some cases, political activism. Anonymous just happen to be a group of people on the internet who need just kind of an ally to do as we wish, but we wouldn't be able to do in the regular society. There's more or less that point of it and do as you wish. That's the common phrase. We are doing it for the lulls. Uh, Trent Peacock search engine in the face of Anonymous. Uh, it's a quote from February 7, 2008. Because Anonymous has no leadership, no action can be attributed to the membership as a whole. Um, Parme Olson and others have criticized media coverage that presents the group as a well-organized uh, homogeneous. And Olson writes that there was no single leader pulling the levers, but a few organizational minds that sometimes pulled together to start planning a stunt. Some members protest using legal means, while others employ illegal measures such as uh, DDoS attacks and hacking. Membership is open to anyone who wishes to state that they are a member of the collective. Uh, British journalist Carol uh, Catwaller of the Observer compared the group to a decentralized structure, that of a a group anyone can be part of is a, in it is a crowd of people, a nebulous crowd of people, working together and doing things together for various purposes. The group's few rules include not disclosing one's identity, not talking about the group, and not attacking media. Members commonly use the tagline, we are anonymous, we are legion, we do not forgive, we do not forget, accept us, expect us. Uh, Brian Kelly writes that the 
Three of the group's key characteristics are, one, unrelenting moral stance on issues and rights regardless of direct provocation, two, a physical presence that uh, accompanies online hacking activity, and three, a distinctive brand. Journalists have commented that anonymous secret fabrications and media awareness poses an unusual challenge for reporting on the group's actions and motivations. Uh, Quinn Norton of Wired writes that anonymous, anonymous lie when they have a re no reason to lie. They weave vast fabrications in the form of performance. And then they tell the truth in unexpected and unfortunate times, sometimes destroying themselves in the process. They are unpredictable. Norton says it is difficult in reporting on the group because most writers, including himself, uh, including herself, to focus on the small groups of hackers who stole the limelight from a legion, uh, defied their values and crash violating the law, rather than an anonymous sea of voices all experimenting with new ways of being. So yeah, so this right here kind of really sums up what anonymous is, and the reason why I'm kind of covering and talking about them is because they have significantly influenced the the concept of hacktivism, uh, which we'll here define. Uh, they're the various groups that are associated, particularly laws we would talk about, and the different activities they've done on the internet has um, influenced not only other movements and groups within this space, from things like, you know, the Arab Spring, they supported Occupy Movement, um, the Umbrella Movement, uh, which is the Hong Kong Movement, uh, the protests that have occurred uh, throughout Europe, even Venezuela, the various ways that different groups, you know, try to protect their identity, try to protect themselves, try to engage, uh, raise funds. Uh, speak to the media, not speak to the media, how they uh, self-publish, how they interact and engage, is very much influenced by some of the activities that they did during this very heightened period between, I would say, um, 2007 all the way to about 20, 2012. And it's because of that, uh, their influences and the different things that they helped support and participated in, in um, really um, focused on the internet as not only as a more than just a new a tool or a, an, a pastime activity, but uh, harnessing its power to not only do good or even destructive things. Um, some of the things they've done is, you know, pretty destructive, loss of money, loss of income. But how you can affect change um, through the usage of these target attacks, whether it be DOS attacks or uh, hacking into various servers and disclosing information, um, relentless uh attacks through propaganda and media, um, or counter-propaganda, if you will, pro physical protests out in the streets, uh, has significantly influenced the nature and way upon which, from now on, people are going to start conducting themselves when it comes to political activities, when they try to address the regret of their, you know, address their, their governments around the world, really. It's also influenced how companies engage in, and interact in the things that they support. Uh, even if it was, you know, at one point might have been their economic interest to be, you know, a uh, supporter of net neutrality, the, because of the nature of the way social media and engagement and the way um, hacktivism has come to arise, they don't, these companies do not want to see a dip in their profits and the dip of their um, resources simply because uh, they put their foot in their mouth or they're on the wrong side of things. And so you're seeing a more greater awareness of social issues and social consciousness, uh, not only for, by people, by the, the things and the products that they purchase and buy, which has always been going on, I would say since the 60s, but it's really, I, think I would say the millennials have been very consistent in their purchasing and buying power and the things that they do, versus um, even the generation that started it, which was the baby boomers and, you know, the, the late uh, great generation, uh, the, the youngest members of that generation, um, more so than Xers, if you will. Uh, has influenced the, the corporate nature of companies and they're become more aware of this so that they're not, you know, attack and having their servers go down or having all their secrets spilled out on the streets. Whether or not it actually, this is very surface changes or there's actually, um, actually real things going on is, uh, only time will tell. This is still, you know, even though this movement started in 2003, slash 2004, this is 2017, uh, you're seeing dr some dramatic changes, but I think it's still it's still going to be some time to see whether or not it's beyond just a surface change, but a really fundamental, deep down core to the foundation changes in nature upon how everything is done, really. So how um, companies engage and interact on the internet, how hacktivists and governments uh, engage and, ha and, and uh, speak with one another, how, which social issues come into prominence, how to advocate with uh, your cause, if you will, um, in this very uh, media age.
um, social media, internet-driven age. So I'm going to talk about the rise of hacktivism here. Um, this is a pretty good article from the Journal of Georgetown EDU that kind of covers um, hacktivism, if you will. It's by Dorothy Binning, The Rise of Hacktivism. Uh, this came out in 2015, September 2015. So, the rise of the internet and related technologies brought with it new methods and practices in all areas of human activity, including activism. Activism in particular are affected in two ways. First, new technologies gave protesters a convenient and powerful means to spread their message and mobilize action globally. And second, the topic of this article, technology and innovation gave protesters the ability to employ hack and tools to conduct cyber operations analog analogous to street protests and sit-ins. This blend of hacking with activism known as hacktivism has become increasingly prevalent and is now commonplace. Hacktivism is challenging international affairs not only because it transcends borders, but also because it becomes an instrument of national power. So early history. Um, hacktivism emerged in the late 80s at the time when the hacking for fun and profit was becoming noticeable threats. Uh, initially, it took the form of computer viruses and worms that spread across, spread messages of protest. A good example of early hacktivism is worm against nuclear killers, or wank, a computer worm that anti-nuclear activists in Australia unleashed into the network of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, and the U.S. Department of Energy in 1989 to protest the launch of a satellite which carried radioactive plutonium. By the mid-1990s, denial of service uh, DDoS attacks have been added to the hacktivist toolbox, which is still pretty much a standard set. With hacktivism, and then you have anonymous so hacker groups, and then you have things and organizations like WikiLeaks, and, well, they're not hacktivists, but they do disclose this information. It kind of fits within the realm of hacktivism, but they could be nation states or some quasi organization like the shadow brokers with it, the exploits that they're disclosing, you have a, a shift and change uh, with the usage of the internet and how many different types of organizations are, um, as we went through the hacktivist um, kind of chronological, how it built up on the internet, how people are engaging and how the ease of usage or the barrier has changed. And what ended up happening during the mid-aughts and we're going to talk about WellSec is that you had a um, a different approach and different efforts to engage and interact on the internet and go after different corporations, um, different government infrastructures. And some of it ended up being um, pranks, but and others were like disclosures of activities as it occurred with H.B. Gray. Uh, with that hack, um, disclosing all his emails and information and resulting in H.B. Gray, you know, losing contracts and losing income and then eventually being sold. Uh, you saw uh, the impact of what a hack could do to an organization and company and to, to the government. And as a result of that, these type of activities cause um, the scrutiny of the government to be increased, the FBI to come after the different individuals or organizations, but also embolden different um, groups to do similar activities themselves. But primarily, we're just going to focus on, focus on well set. And you read a little bit from the work, and also um, within the show notes is just, um, some really good um, documentaries on Anonymous, in particular on Walsack. But I just wanted to give a, a general idea or a thumbnail sketch of Walsack. So, Walsack, the World Security, commonly referred to as Walsack, was a black hat computer hacking group that claimed responsibility for several, several high profile attacks, including the compromise of user accounts for Sony Pictures in 2011. So I'm going to skip around here. So one of the founders of Elsoc was a computer security specialist, uh, Hector Mansour, who used the online mo moniker Sabu. He later helped law enforcement track down other members of the organization as part of a plea deal. And we're going to talk about this because that particular hack that really got this group nabbed also put quite a bit, some other individuals um, in jail as well. At least four of the associates of Elsoc were arrested in March 2012 as part of the investigation. Uh, British authorities had previously announced the arrest of two teenagers alleged are uh, well said members, Tifo and Topani. Um, just after midnight on June 26, 2011, a well said released a 50-day of all statement, which they claimed to be their final release, confirming that well said consisted of six members and that their website is to be shut down. Th this breakup of the group was unexpected, and the release included accounts and passwords from many different sources. Despite claims of retirement, the group committed another hack against organizations owned by News Corporation under IP. Uh, be facing them with false reports regarding the death of Rupert Murdoch. Uh, the group helped launch Operation Anti-Sec, a joint effort involving involving Wallsec, Anonymous, and other hackers. And Operation Anti-Sec 
uh, was, I'm not going to go full details in it, but it's a series of hacks at, uh, performed by members of the hacking group, Wallsite, the group anonymous, and others inspired by the announcement of Operation. Wallsite performed the earliest hacks on the operation with the first against a serious organized crime agency on June 11th, uh, or June 20th, uh, 2011. Soon after the group released the information taken from the servers of the Arizona Department of Police Safety, and now it's already released information to the same agency and two more times. An offshoot of the group called itself uh, Wallset Brazil launched attacks on numerous websites belonging to the government of Brazil and energy company of uh, Porto Palace. Wallset claimed the two, two retire as a group. We already covered that. Uh, Mellis released the first catch of the operation on uh, June 27th, June 11th, taken from the anti cyber program run by the United States Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Agency. They continued attacks on the Arizona government. They also launched attacks against the governments of Brazil, Zimbabwe, and Tunisia. The most recent attacks have been large, against large corporations, NATO, and various United States law enforcement websites. Malice has used stolen credit card numbers of police officers to make unauthorized donations to various causes. Others have also committed hacks in the name of the operation, including a hack in the Fox News Twitter account to post a false news story about the assassination of the President of the United States, Barack Obama, and the attack on websites of government entities in various countries. The group involved have published sensitive government and corporate information, as well as emails, addresses, names, and social security numbers, and credit card numbers of website users. Uh, so, it was a series of attacks that went from June to September 12th, June 11th, I mean, June 12th, 2011 to September 12th, uh, September. So, um, the HB Gray, which we already talked about, was kind of the genesis of there's a group forming with the different hackers that participated. I'm going to talk about some of the names of these people here. Uh, Sabu, um, who is Hector Monergo, who made a plea real. Uh, Calpere was suspected for a member of Anonymous, where he used to perform media relations, including hacking the website of the West, West Road Baptist Church during live interviews. Uh, he ran the uh, Wallsup Twitter account on a daily basis, and following the announcement of Wallsup's resolution, he did all po- posts on his Twitter page except for one. Which stated you cannot arrest an idea. Uh, the police arrested a man from Shelton United Kidding at Kingdom of Sudan being Calpare on uh, July 27, 2011. The man was later identified as Jake Davis and was charged with five counts, including unauthorized access to computer conspiracy. He was indicted on conspiracy charges on March 6, 2012. Uh, Kayla K. was Ryan Ackard of London. Uh, KFL, real name is Mustafa Al Basim. The fourth founding member of the group identified the chat logs, attempted to identify him by labeling him as a PHP coder, well developed, and performed scams on PayPal. Uh, the group placed him in charge of maintenance security of the group's website. Uh, Rodney Metro Police announced the arrest of a 16 year old hacker by the name of the T-Flow. Uh, Pawn Sauce joined the group around the same time as Advent and became one of his core members. He was later identified as Darren Martin of Ireland, who was died on conspiracy charges. Uh, Paul Dove identified as Dosha O'Clear Nail of Ireland as died on conspiracy uh, March 6, 2012. Uh, Anarchist identified as Jeremy Hammond of Chicago. He was arrested on access, on access devices and fraud and hacking charges. He was also charged with hacking on the U.S. security computer staff in December 2011. He was said to be a member of Anonymous and Ryan Clare, who sometimes used the handle viral. Clare faced a sentence of 32 months in relation to the attack against the U.S. Air Force and others. Other letters still being after this time, but they have not been uh, identified. And we're going to talk about Jeremy Hammond and this hack on Stratford um, in a moment. Most of them appear to hack for financial profit. They claim their main motivation was to have fun by causing mayhem. They did things for the wills. This is all coming from the Wicca. Um, uh, let's get to the Stratford hack. So, Jeremy Hammond is a political activist and computer hacker from Chicago. He was convicted and sentenced in November 2013 to 10 years in U.S. federal prison for hacking the private intelligence firm Stratford and releasing links to the whistleblowing website WikiLeaks. He founded the computer computer security training website, Hacked This Site, in 2003. So, on March 5, 2012, Hammond was arrested by the FBI agents in Bridgeport, neighborhood of Chicago, for his reaction for his route. Actually related to the 2012-13 uh, staff at email leaks. The indictment was unsealed the following day in Lower Manhattan. Uh, the rest were due largely to the U.S. Uh, to the FBI informant known as Sabu. So what ended up happening was uh, Sabu Hector Bardenergo's identity was kind of leaked by other hackers, and eventually he was picked up by the FBI, and they they flipped him. And um, the reason why they flipped him was you know they did have the goods on him, but he, they also you know is 
the federal government, they pressured him because he was, he had children, he had a family, they threatened to take his kids away from him. Um, he was raising his sister's kids. Uh, he didn't want them in the foster care system. I mean, he had a lot to lose. So it was understandable, given the threat level put up against him and his family, why he would flip. But, um, you know, he gets a lot of shit for that. But I can almost understand it. But when doing such activities like this, you either have to be top-notch with your OPSEC, as they said, your personal information, and making sure nothing is traced back to you. Um, or you just kind of don't do this if you have that much to lose. But what ended up happening was, you know, he got flipped, he named names, people started going to jail. In this case, with um, Jeremy Hammond, and this, we'll get into what the strapper hack is, uh, he's going to 10 years in jail. And again, this comes back to the computer fraud and the loose act, which we'll talk about when we talk about um, Aaron Schwartz, and how this is a very antiquated and malign um, act that needs to be seriously updated or just repealed altogether. So basically, he pled guilty um, computer fraud and abuse act. He was facing life sentences, uh, life sentence for this particular hack. Um, he did not receive whistleblower protection or anything of that nature. A lot of people um, supported um, him and came out and supported him. He's going through appeals process, but he's 2017, he sits in February 2013, so he's been in prison for four years now. And he has no possibility of parole or having his sentences reduced at all. So what, what is the big deal with the Stratford Eno League? So, Stratford Eno League is a public disclosure of a number of eternal emails between the global intelligence company, Stratford's employees and his clients, referred to by WikiLeaks as the Global Intelligence Files. Emails began appearing on WikiLeaks on February, 2000, February 27, 2012, with almost 5 million emails published as of July 18, 2014. The emails are planned to include client information, notes between staff employees, and internal procedural documents and securing intelligence data. These communications date from July 2004 to, through December uh, 2011. WikiLeaks said they obtained these emails from the hacker group Bananas, who broke into the Stratford computer network in 2011. In the initial announcement, Weekly stated that they opened up a database of emails to two dozen media organizations operating in civil countries, including the Macari Company, uh, La Republic, RDA, the Russian Report, and Rolling Stones, along with a sneak peek to the Yes Men. One of the first items released was an email containing a glossary titled The Staff for Glossary, a useful, baffling, and strange intelligence terms, which contained concise and sometimes human the canon definitions, along with pointed assessments of the U.S. intelligence and law enforcement. Some emails have revealed that Stafford had been partnered with Shay Morris, a former Goldman Sachs tracker, along with other informants in order to profit what could be considered inside trading. So there was a lot of dirty laundry that was aired from this, and a lot of people got embarrassed. And when you embarrass very wealthy and rich people, they're just going to come after you. Stafford planned to use the intelligence gathered in order to profit from trading in several worldwide markets. They created an offshore share structure known as a strat cap during 2011, in order to avoid insider trading allegations. The offshore entity set to launch operation in 2012 is outright independent of Stratford. The CEO, George Freeman, told his employees that the Stratford cap is secretly integrated with Stratford. Uh, Freeman stated in an email that in order to avoid legal repercussions from these activities, the company would be retaining a law firm to create a policy for Stratford on the Foreign Corruption Practice Act. Uh, Thomas, Thomas Kareka was once a lawyer for Stratford client, but his email address and the password to his Stratford account released in the week. He's married to Judge Priske, who denied Jeremy Hammond's bail. The hearing was held eight months in Hammond's, in, into Hammond's imprisonment, and the parent conflict and inference had led some observers to question the reality of her ruling. An email involving a Stratford analyst said it's been determined that up to 12 officials in the Pakistani Inter Service Intelligence Agency knew of Osama bin Laden's safe house. Another email indicated that the Stratford Vice President, Fred Brigham, had knowledge of the killing of bin Laden, and the body was not dumped at sea, but rather sent to Dover Air Force Base in the United States. This further further field doubts about the U.S. government's accounting of the killings. Uh, Ynet News reported that according to the internal emails between Stratford employees, Israel and Russia were engaged in exchange of information in 2011, I mean 2008. Israel gave Russia data link codes for unmanned aerial vehicles that the Jewish state sold to Georgia. Uh, the Russian gave the codes for Tor MI missile defense systems that Russia sold to Iran. The emails also stated that during the 2008 uh, South Osset War, Georgia realized that the UPAs were compromised and were looking for replacements for the Israeli-made drones. 
Internal Business Times reported the Stack Writer found that several Central European countries, especially the Czech Republic, had petitioned NATO for missile defenses and F-16s to use against Russia. The Czech Republic, according to unknown Stack sources, stated that if the talks with the U.S. fail, then it will break all ties with NATO and the U.S. in general. Uh, business and insiders reported that Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Nahum was an intelligence source for Shaffer between 2007 and 10. In emails, Fred Britton discussed his personal communication with Nahum. Britton was stated by email that, that Nahum informed him of success in consolidating power with the Luka Party and had him regaining the position of Prime Minister. She had thoughts regarding his distrust of the U.S. President Barack Obama and threatened assassination of his Hezbollah leader, Hazan Nasarli, and declared intentions to unilaterally start a war against Iran. Al Abak, citing internal emails for the Stafford hack, reported that former Blackwater director James F. Smith had relations with Stafford and was for a time considered one of their major sources. Emails appear to show that Smith participated in the murder of former Libyan leader Muhammad Gaddafi and had more recently been assigned to aid in felling against the government of Bashir al-Assad in Syria. In relation to his assignment to Syria, Smith requested the intelligence overview of the Syrian opposition from his Stafford briefers. Over 40,000 documents related with information gathered from the Venezuela, including the status of the army, equipment numbers, plans, and other sensitive information were also released. Various informations had overthrown the government of Hugo Chavez or described from sources inside of Venezuela with references to names such as Antonio Lemisier, uh, who was the caucus mayor, Enrique Cabos, opposition leader, uh, Leopold Lopez, Rafael Paulo, media tycoon, and many papers in, involving Canvas, one of the main strategic councils. One of the documents is entitled How to Guide Your Revolution. Companies. Uh, it's part of the Times of India. Some of the emails are read that Stafford was actually hired by Dow Chemical Company to spy in protest of the Dow ba- disaster. Dow Chemical Company responded with a written statement that they read that major companies are often required to take appropriate action to protect the people and safeguard their facilities and they had not broken any laws. Uh, the the, the Naples Star Tribune reported that according to some of these emails, the Coca Cola Company pays Stafford determined to both extent when the U.S. based Peter supporters traveled to Canada to support activism at the 2010 Olympics. The Coca-Cola company responded to emails and statements saying that they considered prudent to monitor them for protest activities at any major event we sponsor. Emails from Fred Britton revealed a United States government secret indictment against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and other new emails cast out on the rape allegations against Assange. Official response, staff released a statement saying that the release of the stolen emails was an attempt to silence and intimidate it. They also do miss rumors of the CEO George Friedman's resignation. Uh, Stafford stated that some of the leaked emails may be forgot or altered in, to include inaccuracies and some may be authentic, but they will not confirm either possibility. Uh, Wiki leader Julius Anto Rodas is concerned with Stafford's temper to being a private intelligence firm and informants from government agencies with dubious reputations both in the U.S. and abroad, and especially his targeting of activist organization. He also called the company a shadow CIA and stated the emails would reveal the staffers, weather informants, payoff structures, payment laundering techniques, and psychological methods. Uh, former NSA Director Bobby Emmons stated the leak would be damaging to Stafford's business. He previously stated that Stafford is competent delivering high quality intelligence analysis. So this was a big crater to corporate intelligence and to the intelligence infrastructure, and a lot of people got very, very embarrassed by this. And this is what caused really... Um, Something that was considered kind of like for the walls that was um, an organization that wasn't really, you know, nobody was really going after WellSec. They weren't really going after Anonymous very aggressively. But after this particular leak, giving it to WikiLeaks, uh, this particular hack, they were. And this is pretty much why they, you know, they kind of dismantled and separated out, even the cell some activities still continued. And that's because of that, you, you know, um, Anonymous itself changed. Um, many individuals, you know, either left or done things differently um, as a kind of a result of the pushback and the imprisonment of number, a number of different members. And that was a self change. Um, they changed their tactics a little bit. They changed how they speak and talk to one another. Um, and in some cases, they also didn't change because Anonymous doesn't have a single infrastructure. It doesn't have a single leader. And so some take the opinion that they expect the law enforcement is going to infiltrate them. The law enforcement is going to come after them. And they accept that as a, a burden what, they, what, what it is to do. So you have Jeremy Hammond, who, along with other hackers, participated in hacking a Stratford emails. An operation took place in 2011, which is quite... Probably the heat from that is what caused Lulzsec to dismantle. Eventually, 
you know, uh, Hector Monego, a very, mind you, very charismatic um, person, um, called Sabu. He knew how to use media. He had a Twitter handle. Uh, he didn't love the public relations. Uh, he was also a very good hacker in and of himself. Um, if you read the chat logs or see his poster prior to the FBI flipping him, you can see his charisma. You can see how he would be the leader of that particular group and how a lot of people gravitated him or his uh, particular messages propagated throughout the uh, anonymous community, if you will. But what ended up happening is with the Stratford leaks, as it went to with to WikiLeaks and went to other reporters. One of those reporters is Barrett Brown, an investigative journalist out of Texas, uh, who um, was already working um, on various articles and had a strong association with Anonymous itself, um, spoke and talked about them. At one point, he was considered the face of Anonymous because he spoke about it so much and we talked to other media relationships about Anonymous. Uh, he always denied it because he said, you know, he wasn't the face. He's just one of many, if you will. And... <clears throat> He linked the hyperlink to those particular emails, those 5 million emails in an RC chat. And because he linked that and because there were stolen credit cards and all that all that information was disclosed within that hyperlink, he was facing almost 100 years in prison. Again, it has to do with the Computer Fraud Act. He ended up eventually uh, taking a plea bargain. A lot of char charges were dropped. Uh, this scared a lot of reporters and investigative journalists were if you share stolen information, if you share particularly relevant information, all the disclosures that came out of the, these emails and a number of the different articles and investigations he was doing, uh, one of it has to do with an organization he developed for the sole purpose of going um, investigating journalism, uh, similar to WikiLeaks, but more of American-based, more cybersecurity-based, um, more focused um, in that area about governmental institutions and corporations and uh, human rights issues and privacy issues, if you will, focus in that area. Um, he, they went after him, and he, he served time. Uh, he has since been released. He's on, you know, some kind of like probation where he has maybe like a, a year left in his probation. He's had some issues where he got rearrested and then released. Um, the government is also going after his employers by seeking subpoenas about all the information, the emails, and stuff like that that he does, because he still does investigative journalism, particularly about the prison system and about his experience in prison, uh, making exposures about that, but the nature of how prison works, if you will, which, again, upsets people, upsets that infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> let's say he's a prop, uh, a prop, a provocateur, uh, but his the subject matter that, which is very relevant, is very factual. There, you can't say that he's uh, exaggerating, bobby, uh, misleading, or putting false stories out there. It's very well done, very well researched. It's corroborated by other investigative journalists uh, going through the either using the same sources or finding sources of their own that you know validate his particular um, investigative journalism. So he, he's not making shit up. Um, it's not just very opinion based, if you will. It's, it's very well thought out, well done research, and he went to prison for this. And because of this particular leak that really caused a significant heat on anonymous, but particular law set for people to go to jail, or have probation, and things of that nature, and the case of Jeremy Hammond, um, he's serving a 10 year prison sentence. Um, it changed investigative journalism because even though there's WikiLeaks in the Vault 7, uh, shadow brokers disclosing all these exploits. Uh, the very nature that was going on in the early aughts and mid aughts about cybersecurity, about the relationship between government and corporations, these security privacy concerns, which are still ongoing. I mean, people talk about the Snowden leaks and talk about things of that nature. It really fundamentally changed where you're not seeing the in depth analysis that you often do see um, they are saw in the early for many years of this type of uh, investigative journalism. It's very safe, it's very well played, it's very surface level, it's not as in-depth. And when you do get the in-depth articles, it's usually, uh, you see a lot of different media outlets hitting at the same time. So I guess you can say they're covering each other because it, it, it scared people with Julian Assange on an investigation, uh, Edward Snowden, you know, fleeing to another country, uh, 
you know, Barrett Brown going to prison. Other, you know, people have gone to prison. You've had the, during the Bush administration, about uh, sources and confidential sources going to prison. And journalism in itself being attacked. Uh, there's a documentary, uh, the same person who's doing a documentary on uh, the show notes called We Are Legion about hacktivism. And the same person who did the documentary on uh, Aaron Short's um, Internet's Own Boy, which I did the a review of it has done a documentary about the Gawker case between Hulk Hogan and Gawker and um, Peter Thiel fine backing and financing that particular lawsuit. How media is being attacked, is being bought up, is being really corporized and, and um, smothered or um, restricted. And you saw a very early case of this where an individual journalist. Um, was being restricted, it has been in prison for reporting facts, reporting and sharing information, which is their job, but on the basis of the government, on behalf of a private corporation, um, disclosing these type of leaks, which, mind you, these credit card information, um, there's fraud protection, there's, those, those numbers are going to get, you know, stopped, all that is going to get settled, it was a really significant, um, major economic damage, if you will. It's already built a system for those type of protections. But it was a means to target this person and to silence him. Um, so because of that, you have this kind of change within not only journalism and hacktivism about the type of coverage of reporting, but most importantly, the types of corporations that are gone after. Because if you see the, the recent wave of hack, of, um, Activism, if you will, it is not going after the you know intelligence, private intelligence corporations. Even though there has been some disclosures of that nature, it's not to the extent that it once was. It's to, it's kind of gone back to the kind of prank level, and then you have hackers doing the ransomware type of stuff. Now, a lot of it is still going on. You still have anonymous doing things and defacing websites and going after like ISIS and you know rogue nations and certain certain um, companies and things of that nature. But it is not at the level it once was at the very height of this movement, at the very height of um, what was going on here. And it really has to do with the way the lawsuit was taken down. Now, um, all of this is very important, and it just kind of tying things together here with Barrett Brown going to prison because he shared the linkage to the leak that other reporters were doing, like WikiLeaks in itself, you know, Julian Sondi being attacked as well. Um, all these disclosures that did happen because of what was stuck in Anonymous, where they disclosed about H.B. Gray and the Stratford email listings, is that what it ended up happening is he saw further disclosures of the way the erosion privacy, the way that the government is monitoring all these different political activist groups, corporations are doing the same thing, um, for everything from emails to malware to putting actual people on these people and tracking them. Um, and coupled with you know, the Snowden leaks, and now we have the Vault 7 and the Shadow Broker stuff, that you're seeing um, the way the perception of the internet in and itself, not only as a tool for activism and communication, but the way it's being utilized for surveillance. And you're seeing a, a lot of pushback by, by various different groups that typically are not um, normally politically aligned, um, have no type of relationship with one another. With one another, but when it comes to the fundamental need to communicate and privacy, um, are doing so, and so you see a rise in activism. Um, one of those things with like SOPA uh, came out of because of these hacks and seeing these corporations and seeing the, the Snowden leaks and seeing how the erosion of privacy was going on on the internet. You saw the rise of these type of movements. You also saw um, <coughs> primarily, but not as um, you know, primarily you saw with the Wall Street Occupy movement, which, um, if you watch the documentary, is very interesting to see because Rosak, um, Su Sabu, if you will, tweeted out for people to come and meet him in a public gathering, if you will, and show, you know, your, your face, you know, your anonymous face, if you will, and go against the financial structure because of the global collapse, if you will. And this, you know, um, sparked the Occupy movement, if you will. This one tweet as thousands began to gather into um, the area in Wall Street, that little central square area. And 
the, the funny thing is, and when you find this out in the hacker documents, and it has been documented through court documents and other reporting, is that uh, Hector Montenegro uh, Sabu was under FBI surveillance. So the FBI was aware of his tweets. They even coached him on the manner upon which he would engage his fellow hackers and even this type of tweet. So the FBI and their operations to try to, I guess, gather as many anonymous hackers as they could or see who would come out with the support level as and do some type of surveillance end up sparking the Occupy movement, whether that was by design or it just they didn't fully understand what it was that they were doing with that tweet, with that social media or misgaged the public sentiment. It sparked that particular movement and it's just fascinating. Um, but these things happen and the reason we're bringing up anonymous is in the nature is because, once again, um, we're having net neutrality, the issue of the Internet. Um, there's going to be a blackout date on July 12th, and I wanted to kind of cover some of these early um, hacktivists or hacker movements that happen, and the reason why we're getting to this point where it's very relevant to protect all aspects or uh, infrastructures of the Internet, whether it be... Uh, speech. Uh, currently right now in Germany, they're asking the Facebook, Twitter, and various social media sites to take down um, hate speech. Um, you have the issue of Canada where you can have a almost like a, almost a unilateral warrant where you can, doesn't matter where the server is or anything like that, they can take down the site uh, for whatever reason. Um, is, I don't have to look a little more into it, but Canada just recently did something. And there's all these different um, avenues upon which speech and communication is being restricted. And one of them is net neutrality, which seeks to have these different payment channels and payment lanes where these ISPs can charge for you to have a better access to Netflix, if you will, or Netflix so that they have a better access to all the different uh, servers and channels to push out their content. And if they don't pay up or they don't pay the toll, then their stuff gets downgraded. It gets slowed down. It gets throttled, if you will. And it's just very scary because it will restrict, restrict communication. It will slow down the internet. It will fundamentally change the overall infrastructure and the dynamic um, nature of the internet in itself. And even if the rise of decentralized systems, you still um, will eventually have to cover it. You still have to. It's built on top of the already existing uh, even the internet um, sh structure, the way the internet is structured, um, which is controlled by governments and corporations. So how do you get around that and still be able to communicate freely and openly without uh, censorship or restrictions? So in the show notes, I have a link to several different documentaries covering anonymous as well as an updates on where, you know, where are they now when it comes to... Um, the members of Lost Psych and Anonymous, a little bit about Barrett Brown. Um, there's a documentary that was done by Alex Winter, who's responsible for Napster, and a uh, deep web documentary about uh, Ross Ulbricht and Silk Road. Uh, it's only like 19 minutes, or so it's like a little short piece of him um, basically getting out of jail and going towards, uh, in Texas, going to his halfway house. Uh, but the other, very other documentaries are free. They're on YouTube. Um, they're easy to find. I have a show link, uh, links in the show notes, but if somehow those, those particular YouTube video links are um, broken, you can easily find it on YouTube. They're not, most of them are not taken down for whatever reason. They're freely distributed, most likely under Creative Commons. So there's a couple other things. Um, technology I use, I did a, a review of this particular company, but I used 21Co, which is a uh, Bitcoin um, platform. It was a mining company. Still kind of is a mining company. It tracks nodes. You can actually, um, I'm going to be eventually doing the various node applications out there where you can run your own Bitcoin node. But it has a email type of system where you can pay to speak to people through their system um, using Bitcoin. Or you can get paid for doing tasks of this and that nature or get paid for answering questions by other people. So 21Co, I highly encourage you to enter Bitcoin and looking to do networking or listen to my review on Roger's Thought Bubble. Um, 
to look up that site. And the thing that you can support is um, a great nonprofit called FIRST. FIRST is for Inspiration Recognition of Science and Technology. It was founded in 1989 by inventor Dean Cannon to inspire and incite secondary high school students about mathematics, science, and engineering. So it's basically targeting STEM programs. Many companies and organizations have established bridges with local schools and help ensure the future presence of a qualified workforce. Few programs have been developed on the national level. One program that has and has been very successful in its mission is the National Robotics Competition of FIRST. The FIRST conducts regional and national design competitions which demonstrate that engineering, math, and science can be interesting, captivating, and entertaining as a sporting event. Participants is master skills and concepts to aid in learning science and technology through innovative projects and robotic competitions while gaining valuable employment and life skills. Um, the FIRST robotic competition directly served approximately 72 K high school students in 2,900 teams working with mentors. Each team built a robot in six weeks from a kit of common parts designing to meet the, the, this year's game challenge, uh, Recycle Rush. Each team participates in more than two to three day events at 109 locations. So this is an organization that you can help by donating, sharing, supporting, or even engaging, finding out how you can bring this program to your um, local school system that does not already exist. In the manifesto for this episode, uh, the name of the manifesto is Liber uh, Culture Manifesto. It's written by uh, David Berry. It was written in uh, March 6, 2005. We have written this manifesto always wishing to unfold the concepts and practice of free slash lib and open source. We wanted to stretch out so that it might take us in new directions. To start off with, we were sure that the practice of a non Proprietary software code production was not a narrowly technical or economic affair, but rather was something that was always socially political. Employing a critical political economic framework, we wanted to draw out social political aspects of the free slash live and open source in an age of creative capitalism and creative industries. For the exploration and concepts and ideas through intellectual property supported by new perspective technologies has become so important to profit. Consolidation of interest is now seeking to increase its ownership and control of creativity, but this is a disaster for creativity, whose health depends on the ongoing free and open conversation between ideas from the past and the present. At the same time, the copy left ethos was already stretching out before us in myriad ways. In those places where creativity was being divided and exploited by private interests for profit, this not just software, but also art, music, writing, science, design, and so far, and so on. And ethos of sharing concepts and ideas was widening in response. It is stirring for us that the concept and practice of collective creativity continues to deepen in this way. We hope it does not hold up in itself as some members of the movement may wish, but that it continues to recognize its current social political significance and that it stretches itself out in new creative alliances that simultaneously confront and transform the present. So here we go. <clears throat> the Liberal Culture Manifesto. So, a constellation of interest is now seeking to increase its ownership and control of creativity. We are told that these interests require new laws and rights that will allow them to control concepts and ideas and protect them from exploitation. They say this will enrich our lives, create new products, and safeguard the possibility of future prosperity. But this is a disaster for creativity, whose health depends on the ongoing free and open conversation between ideas from the past and the present. In response, we wish to defend the idea of the creative field of concepts and ideas that are free from ownership. One. Profit has a new objective of affection. Indeed, profiteers now shamelessly proclaim to be the true friend of creativity and the creative. Everywhere they declare, we support and protect concepts and ideas. Creativity is our business and is safe in our hands. We are the true friends of creativity. Two, not content with declaration of friendships, profiteers are eager to put in practice the fondness for creativity as well. Actions speak louder than words in the capitalist culture. To display their affection, profiteers use legal mechanisms, namely intellectual property law to watch over concepts and ideas and protect them from those who seek to misuse them. While we are dead to the world at night, they are busy stockpiling intellectual property at an astonishing, astonishing rate. More and more, the creative sphere is being brought under their exclusive control. Three, the fact that profiteers are now so protective of creativity and jealousy seeking to control concepts and ideas ought to arouse suspicion. While they may claim to be true friends of creativity, we know that their friendship is not the same as dependency. It's very different to say, I'm sure you're a true friend because I need you, than to say, I need you because I'm your true friend. 
But how are we to settle the issue? How do we distinguish the true friend from the false? In any relationship between friends, we should ask, are both partners mutually benefiting? Four. The profiteers, um, instability, insati- 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 insatiable thirst for profit clearly benefits from the new friendship with creativity and the creative. Unlike physical objects, concepts and ideas can be shared, copied, and reused without dis- disparagement. No matter how many people use and interpret a particular concept, nobody else's use of the concept is surrounded or reduced. But through the use of intellectual property law in the form of patents, trademarks, and particularly copyright, concepts and ideas can be transformed into commodities that are privately regulated and owned. And artificial scarcity concepts and ideas can then be established. Much money is being made when creative flows of knowledge and ideas become scarce products and commodities that can be traded in the marketplace and increasingly intellectual property laws providing profiteers with vast accumulation of wealth. And artificial scarcity of concepts and ideas can be established. Much money okay, so it's a repeat so far. Informational effective and knowledge based labor has now become a central driver of profit. Indeed, immaterial labor is increasingly replacing industrial manufacturers as the main producer of wealth in the age of technology capitalism. With these developments of the productive process, a new abundant of profit emerges. And alongside the landlords that control agriculture and the capitalist factory owners that control manufacturer vectors, the owners of distribution, access, and exploitation of creative works through through valorization will have emerged. And these same but Victorialists, of course, they are, they are now so vocal in their claim to be the true friends of creative and the creativity, creativity and the creative. Six, for many of us, thought of the intellectual property law still evokes romantic aspirations of solidarity artists or writing seeking to safeguard her or his creative work. It is therefore unsure that we tend to view intellectual property law as something that defends the rights and interests of the creative. Perhaps in some removed and distant time, that was the modest respect in this notion, but this romantic version of the creativity but the creative is certainly no at ease with the current capitalist reality. 7. The world in which creative people now find themselves is a social factory or society factory. The vector views that the whole social world of creativity and creative works as a raw material for commodification and profit. Creative people have thus become de facto employees of the vectors, if not their actual ones. Each concept and idea they produce is available to be appropriated and owned by the vectors through the use of the intellectual property law. What is more, the vectors continually lobby to extend the control of these laws for greater and greater lengths of time. Because the vectors now have intellectual property law of their own, we can now from we can from now more accurately term their laws vector, vectoral laws. Eight, the creative multiple, multitude is becoming legally excluded from using and reinterpreting the concepts and ideas that they collectively produce. In this show, this legal exclusion is being supported by technology means. Using technology as their delegates, the vectors seek to enforce vectoral law by inserting their interests within the technical code that configures information and communication networking devices. To do so, they are currently developing and configuring even more closed technologies and disciplinary machines. Digital rights management software, for example, sequesters and locks creative works, preventing their copying, modification, and reuse. The vector can be using these prospective technologies denies access to those who cannot pay or to those whose sympathies and support are not assumed. They can also explicitly determine how ideas and concepts are, are to be used in the future. In the current era of technology, capitalism, public pathways for free flow of concepts and ideas, and the movement of creativity and the creative are being steadily eroded. The freedom to use and reinterpret creative works is being restricted through legal, legal based but technology enforced enclosures. 9. This development is an absolute disaster for creativity, whose health depends on the free and ongoing conversation and confrontation between concepts and ideas from the past and present. It's shameful that the creative multitude is being excluded from using the concepts and ideas that they collectively produce. Creativity is never solely the product of a single creator or individual genius. It always owes its best to the inspiration of previous works of others. Whether these are thinkers, artists, scientists, paramours, listeners, machines, or friends, creativity is a future point of these similarities cannot su- succeed in a social nothingness. Concepts and ideas depend on their social life, and it cannot be otherwise. Okay. An analogy can be drawn with everyday language that is the system of signs, symbols, and gestures in meaningful use a community of understanding. Spoken language is shared between us, and meaningful utterness is only made possible by drawing on the words that freely circulate within the religious community of speakers and listeners. Language is necessarily now only free. But imagine a devastation situation where there's no longer the case. George Orwell depicted the picture in the 1984 dystopia, and the violence done there to free thinking through new speak helps illustrate this. In a similar way, the control and ownership of concepts and ideas is a great threat to creative imagination and thought. It's also a danger to what I effectively call our freedom and self-expression. 11. Until we see the creative multitude can, can decide whether to perform, to perform or bell. If performing, they become creative and are unable to create new synergies and ideas, 
Your producers and consumers of the standardized commodities that increasingly saturate cultural life. In rebellion, we continue to use concepts and ideas in spite of natural law. They were pious, proprietary thieves, and even terrorists. They, they were then asked to go as criminals to the course of global state power. In other words, a permanent state of exception. The political emergency was declared, which together with the disciplinary normals of, of, of a prosperous, controlled society, was then used to justify and extend the corrosive use of state power and the repression against an increasingly criminalized culture of creativity. But as we will soon discuss, a growing number of the creative have now moved beyond both conformity and rebellion. Through an active resistance to the present and the creation of an alternative creative field of flows of non owned concepts and ideas. 12. The vectors and their representatives will make immediate objections to all we have said. The puppeteers will turn, turn proselytizers and explain if there is no private ownership or creativity, there will be no incentive to produce. The suggestion that ownership of knowledge and ideas promotes Creativity is a shameful one. However possible it may seem from the myopic perspective of profit, to say that creativity can thrive while the creative lack of freedom to reuse concepts and ideas is clearly upside down. After digging a little bit about this, we just now turn this thinking to the right way, the right way up. Thirteen, according to this incentive claim, there cannot happen any creativity, i.e. art, music, literature, design, technology, before the ownership and control of our concepts and ideas. This seems like fantasy. Historians frequently profess to us that the creativity was alive and well in pre-capitalist times before the advent of intellectual property laws. But even so, we must concede that the history is now enough of a fiction to raise some doubt about the form of previous incarnation of creativity in the creative. The incentive claim, however, is even more visible when it implies that, they, that there cannot be any creative currently operating outside of the vectoral property regime. This, of course, contradicts our current experience as historical actors and witnesses. We can now be sure of something that we have already known. Creativity is irreductible to the exploitation of intellectual property. A new global movement of network groups that operate across a variety of creative media, e.g. Uh, music, art, design, and software, is now emerging. These groups produce a gathering, or this long hedger, of concepts, ideas, and art that exists outside the current vector property regime. The creative works of the free slash liberal and open source communities, for instance, can all be freely examined, challenged, and modified. Here, knowledge and ideas are shared, con contested, and reinterpreted among the creative as a community of friends. The concept and ideas of these groups, like the symbols and signs and language, are public and unknown. Again, machinations of profit, these groups are in the process of constituting a really alternative for constructing or model creative life that reflects the force and desires of a creative multitude. So the principles are of attribution and share alike, existing works and ideas are given recognition in these communities. That means while creative work may have all, may always be copied, modified, and synthesized in new works, free of this creative work is valued and recognized by the community for its contribution to the creative as a whole, rightly so. Attribution and share alike are cons cons constitutive principles of the free slash liberal and open source movement and chromosomes in the new mode of creative life that their social practices in. Uh, and then it intimates. 16. These movements adopt an ingenious viral device implemented through public license known as copy law. Whereas copy op copyright operates through the law to prevent modification or use of concepts and ideas, copy law ensures that these concepts and ideas remain openly available and not capable of being privatized. To ensure the concepts and ideas are now not owned while guaranteeing the future synergies based on these concepts and ideas are equally open for others to use. Whereas copyright, copyright, okay, read that. In this way, copyright, all rights reserved, is stood back on, on its feet by copyleft, all rights reserved. It now stands the right way up for creative and can once again look it in the eyes. 17. More broadly, we can say that the non-owned creative works are created by singularities formed into machines of struggle, e.g. G and U, BitTorrent, uh, NetTime Org, uh, Autonome Media, uh, Shush News, the Zapitas, Linux, uh, India Media, and Loco Records. They are horizontal and decentered molecular networks of actors, both human and non-human. They can and should be differentiated from the more centralized disciplinary machines in which the concept of network is now so liberally applied, e.g. network firms, network states, and network wars. As such, they should also be distinguished from vectoral machines, e.g. capitalist corporations, WTO, IMF, and the World Bank, which are closed, hierarchical, proprietary machines that configure and, and territorialize networks, concepts, and ideas. 18. Machines of struggle are continually being enrolled in the new alliance and relations. As the vision and practice of non-owned creative gatherers 
constrict these uh, rhizomatic arrangements of both beginning and winding. Just as the violence of the vectors of the regime is seeking to intensify, it is being met with a real counterpower. The countervailing forces finds it finds its form and strength not through any individual nucleus or singularity stand alone, but through broader relations and alliances. More accurately, therefore, we are taken here. We are talking here of circuits of counterpower, machines of struggle, and creative alliances. Nineteen, the circuits of counterpower bring forth the scope of resistance and the capacity of agency, thus the hope and promise of future roles. When linked together, machines of struggle are able to confront and challenge the vertical regime as a real force. Collecting the arm against the Tutorializing the tutorializing effects of vector vectoralistic capital. Circuits of counter power provide the conditions and capacity of the transformative constitutive action. Such circuits are but one moment the potential power of the creative multitude and organize an effective transformation of the agents. Twenty. We believe that the creative multitude should form themselves into machines of struggle and establish an alliance with the broader circuits of counter power. In so doing, they contribute towards the idea and practice of non owned creative. Creativity and only model of creative life that it intimates. Through collective production and shared creative alliance, they will defend and extend creativity against those who shamelessly remain wedded to the language or practice of private property and profit, and who continually attempt to tutorialize and configure for the purpose of control and ownership. 21. Indeed, we who are already quite, quite a crowd must defend the idea and practice of non owned creativity. For it is only the creative multitude when organized and enrolled in the circuits of counter power will we determine whether a, whether a possible transformation or time is realized. This is the movement that is acting counter to our time and let us hope for the benefit of the possible time to come. Creativity is creating resistance to the present. And that is it for the digital manifesto and this episode uh, about anonymous. Um, Fundamentally, like I, I kind of stated throughout, I just wanted to give a thumbnail sketch of this particular hacktivist organization to kind of give an idea of the changing state of the internet and the nature of how much a lot of the tools and activities and the movement and the way people organize um, came about because of groups such as this and even actions um, when they are disagreeing with well set. Um, allow for the rise of other movements to come into existence. While at the same time, with you know, journalists like Barrett Brown and the Jerry Hammond of the group of Wilsek, uh, who's been spending the longest time in prison, about uh, 10 years, um, <clears throat> you see uh, a shift in nature of the way certain things are attacked or disclosed or shared and information is revealed because the threat of the governmental state or the response is is very severe, if you will. And because corporations have such a strong influence, um, you see a lot of um, harsher sentences or um, a foot up, you know, people's asses when it comes to certain investigations um, that occur within this space. And the reason I'm bringing it up again is because we're trying to coalesce my thoughts on this is because, you know, with the July 12th blackout date, with the protests about net neutrality and all the different comments that are going on there, um, it's important to keep that in mind because there is a very big, huge shift between the people versus the government. Um, we talked about it on, you know, uses the shy a little bit here on the word of the metaverse. There's a lot of protests going on across the globe. Some are violent, some are not so violent. Uh, for example, um, Venezuela is going into its third month of protests against its government. Um, we have a lot of protests going in, in various European countries about, you know, Romania and changes to the law and things of that nature. Here in the States, there's been different types of forms of protests. I believe there has really been a protest every month in the States about either a particular subject or um, stance that the government's had, um, particularly uh, the presidential administration stance, um, which is very unprecedented unprecedented for this um, country to have a protest every month. Very, very much April, May, June. We are in July. I'm sure there's going to be one here in July soon enough. Um, it's, just, it's just something that's not occurred before uh, in the States, at least. And there's other 
uh, protests around the world is doing a heavy focus on the states and itself. So keep that in mind when you start seeing articles about net neutrality, the different corporations, possible investigations, there may be a little bit of hacking going on, um, all these activities. Um, we're going to talk about Aaron Schwartz and a little bit about SOPA now. The beginning of um, the you know blackout movement, if you will, uh, which I've been utilized before, as we talked about in the activist um, the, you know history disclosure here, but all day. Um, type of oil or significant portions of the internet were very much inaccessible, not only within the states but globally, to counter the um, efforts on the part of the government to restrict the privacy and restrict um, the activities of individuals on the internet, but most importantly, the surveillance of all to seek out the few. So that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. Logging off for now. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network Induction.